Good evening to you all. My name is Tina. I'm going to introduce the evening's program lineup to you. First, please, everyone turn off your cell phones. Turn off your cell phones. Take this moment to do that. And just before I get going, every, you guys look so great. And there are so many familiar faces here. Thank you for coming out to hear Michael Parenti speak. Thank you for being a part of this uh, collaborative effort between the Union of Progressive Iranians, Michael Parenti, and KPFK. UPI is grateful to KPFK for sponsoring this event. I'm sure most of you are already aware of KPFK's commitment to broadcasting alternative voices through listener-sponsored, totally commercial-free radio. That can also be heard... <laughs> KPFK can also be heard streaming via live audio at kpfk.org. So if you're not familiar, get in touch with kpfk.org. Just know that if you want the truth behind the current events involving Iran, the Middle East, and that entire region, KPFK is your source. Our goal here this evening is to further enlighten you as well as encourage you to support our efforts with your own form of social activism whether it's reading a few of Michael Parenti's books or getting into the streets and joining the hundreds of thousands of protesters demanding their voices be heard. So do that. 500,000 people were in New York protesting against Bush. So get out there and make your voices be heard. We've assembled some information tables outside for you uh, to gather some information and literature from. You'll hear their solidarity messages in a little while. Tonight on the third eve of 9-11, some of the best known and most vital organizers in the peace movement are joining us. So do take this opportunity to get involved, get literature, get information about the next protest near you. Just get out there. There's a lot of vigils and I would think you'd want to be a part of it. This is a very crucial time, not, in, not only in our, in our country's history, but the history of the world. We thank you for the donation you've made at the door. This program really would not be possible without that. Please make a concerted effort when you leave tonight or at any moment when you have a chance. We've left a form up there for you to fill out your name, phone number, email address before you leave. We want to be in touch and we want to do this again and again. Um, and to start this evening, we're going we're gonna to have a short audiovisual segment for you. Just to give you some context about some of the information we're going to give you about Iran and um, Michael Parenti's talk. Uh, next, my friend, after the video, my friend Reza will come up and introduce our honored guest, internationally known, award-winning author and lecturer, Michael Parenti. If you go to his website... If you go to his website at michaelparenti.org, you will see a list of at least 18 books and countless lectures to peruse through. An excellent and easy website to use. I highly recommend it. And it's, it'll just help the activist in you come out because there's so much there. Um, and most recently, his book titles, um, Super Patriotism and the Assassination of Julius Caesar. You should check those out. Very worthwhile. Those are two seconds. Those are two separate books. I know that. Those are two separate books by both. By both. <laughs> Following our keynote speaker's talk, we will we'll be doing a question and answer session. You'll have a chance to interact with Michael Parenti and a few other members of our Union of Progressive Iranians. We're going to do a panel up here. We'll also arrange a table for Michael Parenti to sign your purchases. There's very few copies here tonight, so if you're interested, get into that line right away when we wrap. Uh, so let's get started. We're going to have Patrick do a um, solidarity message from all the ta tables outside. Thank you, Tina. Okay. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm with the Green Party and also the Bundle Peace Division. Did you come up on the slide? I cannot hear you. Ando, live mic, please. We're recording. We're, we're, we're recording. So we're please come up here. Well, I have to pass the microphone to people, so. 
Well, let that go there. That one can record it. Here? He says try it. He says try it now. Can you hear me now? Okay, also we need to record. I guess I'm switching over to a different set of microphones. Now can you hear me and record me? Okay, great. All right. Wow, what a nice crowd. This is great. Okay. Yeah, maybe so. Um, uh, first on our list... First on our list is uh, Sako with the International Action Center, but I think he may be busy helping to coordinate. Um, oh, there he is. Okay. So if you uh, could welcome Sako. Again, he's with the International Action Center. Good evening. Thank you for all uh, for coming. Well, I'm, uh, as you said, I'm Sako with the International Action Center. Is this too loud? I'm sorry. Okay, is this better? Yeah. Okay, so I can hear myself. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, we at uh, the International Action Center was uh, founded. Uh, is this, uh, how about this? Yeah. It's okay? Okay, okay. I'll, I'll get this eventually by the end of this evening. Uh, the International Action Center was founded by Ramsey Clark uh, in 1991 in response to the first uh, military attack uh, by the U.S. Uh, on Iraq. Uh, the uh, International Action Center has been involved uh, in uh, uh, the struggle for social justice and against war and against racism. Um, we believe that only a true people's movement will be able to change the policies of this military prison industrial complex in the same way that a people's movement under the leadership of Dr. King and Malcolm X and others was able to change some serious policies, uh, some racist policies, or the way that people here stopped the war in Vietnam. Now, of course, not to take anything away from the heroic struggle of Vietnamese people against U.S. imperialism. Uh, what we witness now is, again, another attack, yet somewhere else, on innocent civilians, on a sovereign nation that had no, that posed no threat to the U.S. The, they used the pretext of 9-11 and WMDs and whatever else they could find to attack this nation. And we all know what the real reason was to subjugate the entire nation for, the, for profit, for the Wall Street, for the billionaires, for the bankers, for the McDonald Douglases, for GMs and GEs, and for Halliburtons and Bechtels and others. We, okay, thank you. That's 60 seconds, I think, already. Okay, so, so once again, the, um, when we are faced with continual attacks on labor, on unions, when wages are stagnating, and when healthcare system is being cut, and schools are deteriorating, and when there is continual war, and there's oppression on the streets of South Central Los Angeles to Detroit and everywhere, there's police brutality, then we need to form a movement, and we need to be on the streets of America to challenge the state, the government, to tell them that enough is enough and we will not stand for it. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, next we have John, who is a uh, co-coordinator uh, with the Los Angeles Million Workers March. Do I have that right? That's right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll be brief because I got 60 seconds to be brief. Um, you know, these, these sanctions, now the U.S. is talking about putting sanctions on Iran, and we know how deadly those sanctions are and how, how uh, terrifying that is. A prospect and that this parallels the attack on workers here in this country but there's a big fight back against the attack on workers here in this country a strong fight back from labor and it's and then it's it's called the million worker march on October 17th in Washington there's going to be a million worker march endorsed by 
the National Education Association, two million member, uh, uh, the uh, AFSCME districts, uh, 37, 125,000 members, uh, American Postal Workers Union, 300,000 members, on and on and on, central, central labor uh, leaders, local uh, union presidents, uh, a big list of folks. And it's the union movement saying that they want to put a demand on these politicians who refuse to take us out of Iraq, who refuse to give us health care who refuse to give us a, a decent opportunity so that our children can grow and, and, and have a decent future. Uh, that's what the demands are. And uh, these demands are something like national health care, national living wage. We all have to fight for this. What the Million Workers March is, it is a structure for the fight back, a structure of the movement, to build the movement on the foundation of labor. That giant, that sleeping giant labor in this country is waking up, and we should be a part of it. And there's a table back there. You can sign up. To, uh, to, to help the volunteer, to support it, to get some people over to Washington. Uh, we, we're going to be very active, so I hope everybody will, will come. There's a meeting t Tuesday, uh, September 14th, this Tuesday. Uh, there's going to be a kickoff and fundraiser for the Million Worker March. Hope to see everybody there. There'll be, there'll be leaflets out there. And I probably forgot something, but <laughs> that's it. Thank you, John. Uh, next on our list. Uh, that was John uh, million work, uh, from the Los Angeles Million Workers March. Uh, next we have Lisa with the Glendale Peace Vigil. I'm Lisa Lubo and I'm with the Glendale Peace Vigil. Two years ago, across the Southland, something happened that had never happened before. People in at least 135 different neighborhoods in the Southland went down to their local corner and started demonstrating against the war in Iraq, as well as the Patriot Act and a number of other peace and justice issues. For decades, people have fought traffic in LA, as well as the fact that everybody's got a different idea of what the issue is, the strategy is, and the truth is. With the vigil movement, people took initiative in their own ways on their own corners. And if they didn't like what somebody was doing on one corner, they went to another corner. Today, the vigil movement is going strong. There are still at least 50 vigils. that meet at least once a week on the corner to pass out leaflets, hold signs, and talk to bystanders. People like the Glendale Peace Vigil put on programs as well. We have usually at least 200, not quite this crowd, but at least 200 people when we show film showings here. The vigils are also have various kinds of committees. We have a relationship. Some of our members are in the opt-out committee fighting the recruitment of high schoolers in the schools, the military in the schools. We also have people that are members of a Patriot Act committee, repeal the Patriot Act, and Glendale just succeeded in being the, I think, 345th city to pass a resolution opposing the Patriot Act. It happens because people like you realize that you don't need to have a whole lot of people and a large structured organization. Any one of you can take, a fl can take an article you like, put it on a flyer, go down to the corner and start handing it out and meet a couple of other people. Uh, the Glendale Peace Vigil, last point Patrick, the Glendale Peace Vigil on October 15th in this auditorium at 7 o'clock will be showing one of the best films I've seen called Hijacking Catastrophe, 9-11, Fear, and the Selling of the American Empire. And it is a wonderful documented portrayal of the evolution of the neocons and their policies overall. I hope you all will be here. We should have a sign-up list for the Glendale Peace Vigil out there, but if not, let me know or one of the other vigilers know. We'll be glad to put you on the mailing list. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Next we have Grace with the L.A. Sound Posse. Yeah. Hi, I'll make it short. I'm Grace with the L.A. Sound Posse. What we do is we record talks and events that deal with social justice issues, and in fact, we're recording tonight's event. We make it available for free download on a website. We also anti-copyright our talks so that if you get a copy, just like the transmission of cassette tapes to help overthrow the Shah, if you get a copy of our CDs, we welcome you to burn copies and share it as widely as possible. So please check out our table in the back. We have flyers and we have several CDs of Michael Parenti's, as well as one dealing with uh, Kinzer's, um, uh, Stephen Kinzer's report of uh, the first coup in Iran, which is recorded by two recordists here tonight, Munsur and Anna. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, next we have next we have uh, Cheryl Roberts, and Cheryl, you are with. Tell me again, please. Coalition against militarism in our schools. Okay, Cheryl. <laughs> so uh, we need everybody's help here tonight. Um, uh, no Child Left Behind has mandated that the schools are required to give out personal home contact info um, of all of the students, um, especially juniors and seniors. Um, and it's also been mandated that the kids be given an opportunity to opt out. But the, the unfortunate part is that virtually nobody knows about it. It's typically hidden on the school handbook on page 95 and nobody mentions it. So we really need a strong grassroots effort to let everybody know, any parent you know, any kid you know, please let them, um, let them know about this. And the Peace Vigil table has the has the Glendale form. The deadline is October 1st for Glendale, October 22nd for LAUSD. The form can uh, be downloaded at militaryfreeschools.org. We also have a, a great event coming up um, about Operation Opt Out with author Luis Rodriguez coming up and also the film uh, debut of Arlington West by local filmmakers Sally Marr and Peter Dudar that will be in Highland Park on uh, Sunday, September 26th. I hope you all can make it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Also, uh, Lisa quickly asked me to uh, announce that the Glendale Peace Vigil does meet every Friday from 5 to 7 o'clock. I was in the Glendale. Brandon Broadway. Brandon Broadway. Okay. <laughs> Next we have Philip with the, uh, the Green Party. Uh, you are very beautiful people. It is so amazing to stand up and watch all of you, look at all of you, and, and uh, just to realize that you're here to uh, learn more and to understand more about our world and our culture and our democracy. And I encourage you to take that energy, that optimism into this election, vote positively, vote affirmatively, and elect people that will repeal the USA Patriot Act, elect people that will never vote for war. Uh, elect people that will make sure that our troops are supported by bringing them home and giving them quality educations and quality homes. And uh, just keep being beautiful people. If you can't vote because you don't happen to be a citizen, you can have so much power. You can carry five people to the polls on November 2nd. And I encourage you all to exercise that power and get out there and vote. It's so important this time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Philip. Okay, well, we can talk about politics uh, after the, the show if you'd like. We have a table in back. Uh huh. Okay, so after uh, Philip, we have uh, Henry with uh, Libros Revolution. Salam te habar. Uh, I'm Henry. I got a book table here from Libros Revolution. I just want to highlight two things. The revolutionary worker, if you're looking for truth in a time of war, lies, and patriotic pipe, you can't afford to miss a week. And the new video, Revolution, why it's necessary, why it's possible, and what it's all about with Bob Avakian. Yuri Kochiyama, a lifelong activist who spent World War II in an American concentration camp, said, with the, what the world is going through right now, this moment is crucial and liberation must be international. We must stop U.S. imperialism. We must create a vision of that just and equitable world and collectively work to make it a revolutionary reality. This speech needs to be heard by others it could take many more people onto the path towards world liberation. Marbar imperialism. Okay, thank you very much. And our last speaker we have is Ralph from Justice Vision. I belong on the other side of the camera, but. Uh, I'll try this. Uh, anyway, I do uh, Justice Vision, uh, Democracy University video series. We do eight and a half hour compilation tapes. So this might be one of five events that you'd get on a tape for $5. So you get a lot for a little. And we also provide tapes for the Fund Drives at Pacifica. We've just put together from some of the stuff that we've been given permission, some of the tape stuff we've taped ourselves. Uh, I told you a little bit about it in the line. The Rebeat Bush, Rebeat Bush Toolkit. It has uncovered, it has life and liberty in the balance of war on the uh, uh, dock on the war in Iraq by Fellini's understudy. 
uh, Aldo Vidali. It's got a section on electronic voting by Amy Goodman, 50 minutes with her, and INN World Report, 45 minutes. It's got a fundraiser for Carrie Edwards with Diane Feinstein and Ariana Huffington. It has moveon.org's, sorry. It's hard to get Carrie Edwards supporters out. Uh, moveon.org's winning ads, uh, four of them on here. And Michael Moore, Cal State LA, 70 minutes of Michael Moore. So we're an educational, we do, uh, Democracy University is educational. It gives you the, enough information to rebut the people on the tape when they need to be rebutted as well. And we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you all for making your solidarity speeches. We've all learned so much from you. So next, uh, we're going to have, is that funny? Is that funny? Okay. Uh, oh, no, it wasn't sarcastic. It just wasn't. Um, next, we're going to have Ando put on the uh, documentary short film we've prepared for you. And can someone help me move this podium, please? Shut off your light. In prisons, to women and children, and in terms of the similarities uh, of, of, of the population of Iran, which is being continuously and systematically abused by its population. I have been active in left organizations in Iran long, long time and during the shock. At that time, I was captured at high school and sent to prison for a year because I supported the um, nationalization of oil against British Petroleum. In fact, I was part of the uh, student opposition at that time. In uh, 1953, the elected government of Musaka was overthrown by CIA conspiracy and British intelligence both actually got together and used military force to overthrow this government and uh, re-established the dictatorial form of the uh, regime uh, by the Shah. He was in the power for 27 years. We were in the revolution against Shah. We wanted to change. We wanted to have a democracy in our country. In speech, in every, every the uh, revolution in Iran happened uh, during the 1979, uh, and uh, it overthrew the, the uh, Shah government in the winter of 1979. It was a small period of time of liberty, of freedom. We had lots of demonstration. I do remember. They were asking questions because they wanted to change.
So from the film now, we're going to move into, uh, I'm going to introduce Reza. Reza is responsible for gathering us together, the Union of Progressive Iranians. We all would see one another at countless protests and documentary viewings, and Reza started getting us all together. Um, his activist efforts span all the way back into the streets of Tehran, linking the Rats riots, riots and the Gulf War together. Uh, meet Reza. Yeah, I really make it short. Uh, on the behalf of Union of Progressive Iranian in Southern California, we take this great opportunity to give, to give out thanks and appreciation to one of our international heroes. One, one whose heart is big enough to have a place for each person from every different land and nationality. Yes. We commend this wonderful human being and use him as a role model for all of us. Oh no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> this, this is the epitome of international sentiment and you, Dr. Michael Prenti, stand side by side with the people from around the world which has in fact immortalized yourself. And we are therefore honored to be associated with you. Dr. Michael Prenti, who is author of several books, an activist, internationalist, and a great friend. I would like to welcome Dr. Michael Prenti. Thank you. Uh, it, it's always embarrassing when the applause you get before you speak are longer than the applause you get after. <laughs> yeah, so we don't. But, um, well, before you leave, let me get a few words in here. Let me think. <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, empire, because there's, there's an enormous disparity between what empires actually do and how they're represented in history and even how this one is represented today as you know how they're represented by their leaders and their chroniclers okay there's the mic uh, empires I noticed are actually present to us as creations of peace they're even named after peace Pax Romana Pax Britannica and there's even Pax Americana. That is, this is a period of peace where one rule prevailed over the world. Empires are represented as bringing stability, justice, and prosperity to their subject peoples. They're represented as selfless things, large impersonal organizations that bring order where there once had been disorder. Gibbon. Edward Gibbon, who wrote the great masterpiece, politically terrible book, but it's great to read anyway, uh, The, the uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. He gives a perfect 
He gives a perfect example of the mythology of empire. This is what he says about Rome. I quote this in my book, The Assassination of Julius Caesar. I have some of this. So these are crib notes from the book. All right. But he says, the obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary, and permanent. The vanquished nations blended into one great people, resigned the hope, nay, even the wish of resuming their independence. The vast Roman Empire was governed by absolute power under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> See, not a word here. Not a word here about an empire that's built, uh, an empire of shattered armies, sacked towns, enslaved prisoners of war, mercilessly overtaxed populations, slaughtered herds, raped women, burnt crops, whatever else. 1877, John Morley, an English political leader and writer, talks about the British Empire. We have had imposed upon us the unlucky prowess of our ancestors, oh, by the unlucky prowess of our ancestors. I should, I should translate that sentence, that, that what I've said so far. Meaning, the power and the efficacy of our ancestors has imposed upon us See, empires are never pursued ruthlessly and, and carved out and all that. They're just imposed on people. It's fine, we, we have an empire here. So, we have had imposed upon us by the unlucky prowess of our ancestors the task of ruling a vast number of millions of alien dependents. We undertake it with a disinterestedness and execute it with a skill of administration to which history supplies no parallel. You see, and that's interesting by calling them dependents, because in fact you are working these people to death. You're expropriating from them. They're supporting your luxuries and your incredible surplus wealth um, with their labor and deprivation. But you call them our dependents. You reverse the roles. You say, we are taking care of them. Empires are sometimes represented as unintentional conglomerates the product of unconscious circumstance. And there's an awful lot of that in political thinking in America today. That it's all unintended consequence, that it's all mix up, foul up, lack of information. Oh, what do you have, a conspiracy? You think they're actually thinking about these things? And deliberate. But it's unconscious circumstance. The British Empire, when I was a kid, I heard the British Empire was put together in a fit of absent-mindedness. <laughs> How the hell do you put an empire together in a fit of absent-mindedness? Cyril Robinson, a British historian, says that, and a classicist, I take him to task in my, in my book on, on, on Caesar and the Roman Empire, and the Roman Republic, actually, where I wrote about. Robinson says the same thing about the Roman Empire. He says, it was perhaps almost as true of Rome as of Great Britain, that she acquired her world domination in a fit of absence of mind. And we hear that today about the United States, that the United States was reluctantly thrusted onto the world stage as world leader. They were thrusted into the role of world leader. They never say, who did the thrusting? <laughs> Generations of Americans were taught, were taught to think of empire and imperialism as something that other countries do. Imperialism is the process of empire. That's what empires do. They do imperialism. And imperialism really is when the ruling interests of one country expropriate the land, the labor, the resources, the markets, and the capital of another country. This is what other countries did. There, so there was the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the Mo Mongol Empire, the Spanish Empire, and the one that was painted as the most repressive and deadly, the one that was really a bad empire. There was the, the Soviet Empire. Remember that? <laughs> Which came apart when 100,000 people marched in Moscow. This ruthless, power-hungry Soviet Empire which in fact 
is not even around anymore. But there was no American empire. I remember my teacher, Grace A. Myers, in the sixth grade telling us the United States is one of the very few countries in the world that does not have colonies. We have possessions. <laughs> that was the term we were doing. We have, and, and we had maps on the wall in PS 85 in New York City. Alaska it was then, uh, it wasn't a state, and Hawaii, and they were called territories. We had possessions and we had territories. We didn't have colonies. We weren't col colonialists. This denial was made easier by the innovation of neo-colonialism or neo-imperialism. Um, almost a half a century before the British thought of doing it in India, the Americans were doing this in the Sandwich Islands, better known to you as Hawaii, and then later on doing it in Cuba. And Puerto Rico. No, no, not Puerto Rico. They didn't do it in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a possession. <laughs> it's a commonwealth. Compañero. Um, they did it in Cuba. They said, they went to the Cubans and they said, listen, we stole you fair and square from the Spaniards, but it doesn't look so good. We're a republic and uh, it doesn't look good. We have colonies and all that. So we're going to give you your independence. And you're going to have your own flag. It's going to be red, white, and blue. <laughs> you get only one star because you're just a little island. You, know? you have your own presidente. You're going to have your own Congress. You have your Guardia Civile. We'll train and arm and show them how to beat up and kill your citizens, the ones that get out of line and all that. And, and you have your own money. You don't have to put George Washington on it. You can put Jose Marti, anybody you want. We're flex, we're flex. But you can put the, or this general, that general. You can put Cubans on your own money. And all we are going to have in exchange is we will own your sugar industry, your tobacco industry, your nickel minings, your oil refineries, your all your, and we control all your imports and exports and your tourist industry. But, but you're independent now. There you go. <laughs> That's what neo-imperialism is, where you give the country the accoutrements of independence while you control that country's land, labor, natural resources, and wealth, or the better part of it anyway. But why should the U.S. be called an empire, some said? Isn't it enough to call it a superpower? But it's a superpower that exercises that power through direct and indirect intervention into the affairs of these countries to actually change their developments, to actually rob them of their futures and change their future, change their interior conditions, their political arrangements, their social institutions. Well, why are there these empires? Why do these people do this? I already answered the question, I think. But it's interesting, you can read all sorts of accounts about empires, and you can read all sorts of accounts about empires in general and all that. And nobody asks the question, but why do they arise? You hear descriptions, and the Mongols came down through here, and this happened here, and then they went into this country, and they took that, and all. But why do they do all this? Why do they exert themselves in this way, killing large numbers of people? Is it just all about conquest? Is it conquest for conquest's sake? Power for power's sake? Actually, no. Power is mostly an instrumental value. Very few instances in history where they pursue power just for the sake of power. Oh, individuals climb up the power ladder, fight up the greasy pole, uh, fighting their way up the greasy pole, as Disraeli called it. They want office, they want fame. But the actual policies they have to pursue also involve something else. There are real material interests at stake. Plunder, Tribute, resources, markets, expropriating the land, the crops, the cheap labor, or as in ancient times, not so ancient actually, even still today, the slave labor. The uh, UN report shows it must be about 24 countries where slavery still exists in one form or another. Empires are enormously profitable for the ruling class. Empires are enormously costly for the common populace. We see that today, right this time, right now that's happening. 
The war in Iraq is not a failure. The war in Iraq is very profitable for certain people. It canceled every foreign concession and contract with China, Russia, France, Malaysia, Italy, Brazil. And every one of those concessions now belong to American companies and they're taking out billions of dollars of oil. It's very profitable. It's also very costly for us. $166 billion in less than a year, we are going to have to pony up to pay the cost of repressing those people. And they don't care it costs so much because we're paying the cost and they're skimming the cream on it. And that's why you shouldn't say the way John did up there, John Stockwell, my friend. He shouldn't say, he's always in that bad habit and a lot of people do that. Howard Zinn does it, Chomsky does it, they, oh, so many of them. We did this and then we did that, we did this. It's not we, there's no community of interest we have in this empire. We're, we're among the victims too. I'm doing that. <laughs> and the empire feeds off the resources of the republic. That's what the empire feeds off. That's what sustains the empire. And every gun, every plane, every Humvee that gets blown up, every missile that gets fired there, that's just that much less for school funds and that much less for public hospitals and that much less for human services and all. And that's okay with them because that's just what they don't want. They want a big deficit. A deficit is a way of privatizing the public budget. That means a larger and larger chunk of every tax dollar you have goes to rich creditors. We are borrowing money from the people we should be taxing. It's a very rational system. That's why, that's why you have conservatives r r r racking up these huge deficits. Ronald Reagan came in with an $800 billion national debt. The national debt is the accumulation of yearly deficits. A deficit is when the government pays out more than it takes in. How can it do that? By borrowing money from rich creditors. The same people whose taxes you cut, you now go to them and borrow money. It's a safe form of invest investment for them. Full faith and credit of the U.S. government backs their money and they can put it in and they can collect enormous amounts of interest on it. The bigger the deficit, when Reagan left office, that, that national debt was, was at 2.5 a uh, trillion dollars, from 800 billion to 2.5 trillion. Today it's upwards of 6 trillion. And, and George Bush is running a half a trillion a year, practically, or more. They want to do that. It, it absolutely subverts the public budget. They know that the military budget is untouchable because they just got to tell people this keeps you alive against all those evil threats. And so it's going to come out of human services. It also then serves the function then of cutting back on human services. That slime ball, that slime bag, uh, uh, Alan Greenspan just the other day started talking about how we got to cut back on, on Medicare and Social Security because of this deficit, you see. Um, so this is, this is where it's going. Well, so there's people who live very well off empire. I thought we were going to see this film on most of the day uh, tonight. We didn't see it. Um, but I remember I ran into an Iranian woman just a, a, a few years ago. She'd lived very well under the Shah. She left after 1979 when the Shah was booted out and all that. And she talked about things, and she seemed like a very intelligent, sensitive woman. So I said, well, what was life actually, because I had Iranian grad students at Cornell back in 70-something, uh, and they were taught, they, when it came up the question of the Shah, all I saw was in newspapers, the Shah, the great modernizer, the Shah, friendly to the West, the Shah uh, of Iran, oh, the Shah, the, oh, the Pahlavi, uh, whoa, what, guy, what great guy, a modernizer, you know, all that stuff. And these students would start, when I st talked about, I raised the question, of the <coughs> they would get livid. I mean, the danger part of this, they hate him, we could kill him. And they start telling me stories of a friend, a cousin disappeared at the airport, the Sabak torturers and this and that. I said, I don't hear any about any of this in the U.S. media. This Shah, 
who gets his picture taken with every American president, with Senator Kennedy, with uh, all sorts of political leaders and all that. Uh, this Shah is something more I'm not hearing here. And then they overthrew him. So I said to this very nice lady, I said, what was life under the Shah? And by the way, these students were from pretty good families. I mean, good, I mean, affluent families themselves. You don't go to Cornell Graduate School uh, from Iran unless you got some, some uh, bucks. And so she, I said, what was life like under the Shah? And she said, perfect, perfect. <laughs> and you know, as I got a description of it, I put it together. It was perfect. She was rich. She had a state. She had a a country place she went to, she had a small army of servants who you, you pay a few pennies a day because they're, they're so desperate they had to work hard. Um, and she paid no taxes. One of the things Mossadegh did was he tried to tax rich Iranians. And, and they tried to confiscate their property if they refused to pay the taxes. Well, that's the class. She was of that class of empire. They exist in all these countries. It's not the Americans versus the Nicaraguans. It's the rich American plutocrats in collusion with the rich Nicaraguan and Iranian and Iraqi and <clears throat> Brazilian and Venezuelan plutocrats versus the people of all those countries, including our own. So that class becomes the truth of the union. In recent years, it's actually become respectable for conservative pundits to say, to say that we have an empire. Grace A. Myers would be shocked, my sixth grade teacher would be. <laughs> but you actually hear them saying this, and you know, having the power, if I understand them rightly, since we have the power, this gives us a sense of entitlement. We're the strongest nation in the world, and we have every right to act as such. You hear them saying things like that. Means meaning you can go and whack anybody who's weaker than you. We're an empire with all the obligations and opportunities and responsibilities of empire, and we better get used to it. Sometimes it's not an entitlement, but a reluctant obligation. A mantle thrown on our shoulders by history. I already told you that one about it. It's just been thrusted on us and like that. Now, since World War II, the U.S. government has given some $240 billion in military aid to train and equip millions of troops and internal security forces and police forces in some 100 or more countries. Why? Not to defend them from outside invasion, since very few of them were ever threatened by attack from neighboring nations, but to protect, I mean, Honduras wasn't attacking El Salvador. El Salvador wasn't ready to invade Nicaragua. Nicaragua wasn't going to attack Mexico. Um, it was really just to protect the ruling oligarchs and multinational corporate investors from the dangers of domestic insurgency. How can we make that determination of intent? I'm imputing a certain intent. That's why it was done. And the question of intent is always a difficult one in, in politics because no one has ever seen an intention or a motive. It's, it's a non-empirical thing. Intent is always ascribed or inferred or imputed. You can't see intent. It's not empirical. I mean, you can see George Bush invading Iraq, but he can... He can cook up all sorts of intentions and say it's because this, that, the other thing, and the like, you see. So how do you make a determination? Well, you can observe repeatable patterns. And you could also even control for certain things. Now, history and politics are not like chemistry in a laboratory where you can control for a variable, hold a constant, and test it, and see, and like. And yet, sometimes that does happen. Sometimes you can see that. For instance, you notice U.S.-supported military and security forces and the death squads in many of these countries have been used repeatedly to destroy popular reformist movements and insurgencies. They haven't been used against plutocrats and big landowners. They've been used against student leaders and peasant leaders and clergy who speak out and journalists who speak out critically 
and trade union leaders and the like. So you can see by who they're killing what their political interests are and what their political intent is. Second, U.S. sponsored forces, not U.S. forces, but these forces that are backed and trained, advised, equipped, and financed by the United States in all these various countries, have never been used, they've never been used to, to assist a popular reformist or revolutionary government or movement in any of these countries. Not in Guatemala, not in Nicaragua, not in Iran, not in Iraq, not in Palestine or Lebanon, not in South Africa or South Korea, not anywhere. And that tells you something about intent. Reformist coalition groups, popular movements that wanted land reform, wanted public services, wanted health care for their people, wanted education for their people. You say you want to help the people of the world and you're killing the people who are organizing, trying to resist the oligarchs to help. That tells you something about their intent. But no help for any of these countries. Not in China either until China opens its economy to massive private investment with millions of Chinese workers laboring without a contract, without protection, 12 hours a day for minimum pay, miserable pay. Not until China privatized and dismantled most of its public health system and its other human services. U.S. forces never assisted revolutionary Vietnam. In fact, they, we spent 20 years trying to destroy revolutionary Vietnam. But today, they're beginning to help and be friendly to them, same as China, because Vietnam is doing the same. The majority of Vietnamese workers in the fast-growing private sector, which is now m m almost uh, more than two-thirds of the economy of Vietnam are, are working, the majority of them are working without a contract. <coughs> so you've really got these countries. So the, the U.S. plutocrats did win the Vietnam, Vietnam War. They're in there and turning Vietnam into a sweatshop. Not, not in Libya, they didn't help and never gave aid. Not when, not, not when Colonel Gaddafi took over that country, kicked out the oligarchs, uh, planted 40 million trees, put up health programs, education for women, um, <clears throat> land reform, and nationalized the oil industry. He became what? A pariah. He was demonized. He was one of the people on their hate list and hit list. Gaddafi, Allende, Tordillo in Panama, and, and, and Noriega, Milosevic in Yugoslavia, um, uh, Saddam Hussein, when he, even though he, Saddam Hussein was a CIA flunky and, and did much to destroy the democratic movement in Iraq. Um, he then became an economic nationalist and that put him on the same hit list. Now Gaddafi is recently opening up the country to Western investment and suddenly he's being welcomed back into the family of nations. <laughs> so there are these remarkably consistent patterns which show the kind of regime, and here's another pattern. Look at the kind of regimes that U.S. rulers have supported. <clears throat> the ones most likely to win U.S. favor are those that are integrated into the global system of free market corporate domination. Those are called pro-West, friendly toward America. They leave their economies open to foreign penetration on terms that are singularly favorable to transnational corporate investors. They adopt neoliberal modes of maldevelopment that starve out the public sector. Chile under Pinochet, the Philippines under Marcos. That's OK, I got water. It's not water. My, my, my voice is just giving way. <clears throat> Zaire under Mobutu supported. Mobutu, who plundered, they estimate, four or five billion dollars out of Zaire, now the Congo. Never a harsh word for him. The CIA was always at his beck and call because he opened up the country completely to the foreign investors, completely on terms favorable to them. Cheap labor, no taxes, no pollution or environmental controls, nothing like that. Anything you want to do, anytime, do it. Peru under Fujimora, South Africa under apartheid, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait under feudalism, Turkey, Pakistan, Nigeria, under police state autocracies. 
I said, I said that ex we can't experiment uh, and test hypotheses as in a laboratory situation, but you see how you can actually do control. Sometimes actually, you actually do get a test where a variable is, is, is removed from the picture and you can, and you can re rerun a test. And that does happen in history sometimes through the force of events. And that puts intent and motive to the test also. Thus, for instance, for decades, we were told that the United States needed enormous military budgets and military bases around the world to contain the Soviet communist menace that threatened to encircle and devour us. So US militarism was an innocent, reactive necessity born of communist aggression. That's what we were told. Some of us argued otherwise. Some of us said that if the Soviet Union were to disappear tomorrow, not thinking it was going to disappear, <laughs> that, the so that, the US, that the US would still pursue a policy of imperialist domination. Well, history made its own laboratory test. The variable was removed from the equation. The Soviet Union was overthrown. And what do we have? What do we have today? A US military budget that's bigger than ever, growing at a faster rate than during the Cold War. We have more military bases than we had during the Cold War. Whole new sets of military bases opening up in Central Asia. Eastern Europe and the Middle East. And we have pursued wars of intervention and control more violently and more frequently than ever, with a whole host of new enemies being conjured up. So it's not the Soviet Union, it was the empire, and it's not the empire, it's the interests of the financial global ruling class. Now, there are those who, who present what I call the other variables argument. There are other variables involved, Parenti. You're being reductionist. You're trying to reduce everything to narrow material considerations. US policy is not motivated exclusively by material considerations. There are other factors such as culture, ideology, or broader strategic considerations, or questions of morality. The Western intellectual world, the US intellectual world, is overpopulated by people whose primary dedication is to deny or at least diminish the importance of material interests by conjuring up these other considerations. Um, somebody's already been using that one. <laughs> I mean, you think you could get a glass, you know, a little <laughs> dignity. So undignified to swig in front of him. Hey, so how am I doing, all right? Hey. Mm. <laughs> Grazie. Grazie mille. Mm. Well, This is the one with the other water, and I know what I'm doing. I, I can see them both much better than you back here. <laughs> we never said, we never said, those of us who, who are urging people to consider a class analysis, that class interests are the only thing that motivates political protagonists, but it's a major powerful one, so could we talk about it once in a while? <laughs> To show that something is central or very important does not oblige us to prove that it's the only thing that's ever in operation in any political or historical context. That's not true, we don't have to do that. And why are we to assume that these other factors, such as culture, ideology, ethnic identity, gender oppression, or morality, are themselves separate and apart from material forces? They too are influenced by material forces why must we assume they're supposedly exclusive or in competition with class, interests, and power? 
Culture is mediated through material morphology and often shaped by dominant material interests. Culture is not something that's mutually exclusive of economic forces. Much of what you call culture is elite dominated, propagated, and imposed on us. To the assertion that intervention is not motivated by narrow economic interests, but by broader strategic interests, that the policy wants like to always bring that word in. Oh, it's a strategic interest that brings us there. It's not the oil, it's a strategic thing. Because that area is so strategically important, the Middle East. I said, yeah, what makes it so strategically important is the oil. <laughs> and when you develop oil in Ant when you find oil in Antarctica, that'll become strategically important too, if it's not melted down and run all dead from it. <laughs> Those who say <clears throat> it's not eco it's the broader strategic interest, I would ask, what in the world is so narrow about material economic interest? Why is that called a narrow interest? Why the spatial metaphors? <laughs> Material economic interests consume much of the necessity of life and society. Whole populations and nations have been wiped out in the pursuit of ruling class wealth. Much of your waking day, most of your waking day, is having to deal with your narrow economic interests, right? <laughs> like paying the rent and getting to work and, all, and, and feeding yourself and all that. Why think, why think that's not important? The planet's ecology itself has been put at risk because of economic interests plundering it the way they are. And why would strategic interest be considered broader? What is a strategic interest? A nation has a strategic interest in a region because the region has some value to it or because the region has entree to another region that has value. And often what gives value are the economic resources or class control consider, uh, uh, considerations. So, I pretty much said what I had to say for the night. Did I talk too long? No. Let, me, let me just uh, point out to you, let me just point out to you the question of Iraq, for instance. There's three basic reasons why the U.S. ruling class supports the invasion and occupation. And these are the same three basic reasons that dictate U.S. interventionist policy everywhere else. First, it's the systemic monopoly. Iraq was one of those countries, here's another way you can, you can measure intent. Every country that's been hit by the US has been a country that's tried to get out from under the global corporate free market investment system. That's what Libya was trying to do, that's what Nicaragua under the Sandinistas were trying to do, that's what Panama was trying to do under Torrio and even under Noriego. It had a left-wing military. They were making all sorts of reforms. Uh, everyone was trying to be self-defining and self-developing. And Iraq was doing the same thing. As I said, Saddam Hussein, even though he was the CIA's poster boy, he then began to commit economic nationalism. He kept the entire economy government-owned. He kept the oil industry government-owned. And you know, they appeal, these politicians appeal to people and say, we got to go in there, you need gas for your car, right, and all that. These countries will sell you, they'd be happy to sell to the U.S. market. It's not that. It's that they don't want to, it's that the cartels don't want to have to buy the oil from them, then jack up the price and make a profit as middlemen. They want to own the oil. They want to own it that's in your ground. The oil, our oil happens to be in your ground. <laughs> but, but we want it. Rumsfeld said that about Saddam Hussein and Iraq. He said, it's a Stalinized economy. I thought that was a fascinating use of term there. And mainly it was publicly owned. And what you have happening now is billions of dollars in public capital is being privatized, handed over. And that includes the hotels, utilities, factories, the media system, the whole infrastructure of their airline system. All of that is being stripped. The Iraqis are being stripped of every trace of public capital they have. And all they're being left with is the debt. Just like us. It's just the way they're doing it here in other places, but more ruthlessly there. So that's the first thing. Iraq 
committed the sin of trying to be self-developing and self-defining. Second, Iraq <clears throat> was a bad example when it did that. Not just, the, not just the essence of that happening, but it was a bad example for other countries, so it has to be contained. Third, there's the straight old colonization resource plunder. After rolling back these countries and maintaining this global system, you do it for a reason, and you go in there and you take out. Iraq it has the second largest reserve of oil in the world after Saudi Arabia. Iran, as far as we know, Iran is third. And you, and you know, and you know that if the Iraqi people's resistance had not pinned down those U.S. forces in Iraq, the U.S. would be in Iran today. They would. Um, you can... And that war, that war is not going well at all in Iraq. The casualties are still increasing. And when George Bush says we have to stay the course, I don't know if you heard me on the radio today, I made this point, excuse me for repeating myself. I said, stay the course. Stay the course. The U.S. The US military in this last week has just, they call it evacuated five, from five cities. You see, it's really called retreat. <laughs> when you got a war going on, people shooting at you and you leave, you are retreating. But the U.S. military, we're never, we're never going to retreat. You come on outside and say that, boy. <laughs> they retreating, including a city of the size of Fallujah. Um, they're not winning that war. They're not sustaining it. When the other side takes over cities, they're winning. Um, so, <clears throat> you got this straight old colonial resource plunder. 113 billion barrels of very fine quality crude. Now that's worth, under, under today's prices, that's worth anywhere between four and five trillion dollars. Now brothers and sisters, I submit that four trillion dollars is not a narrow economic interest. It's a, it's a huge, motherload, humongous economic interest. That's what it is. It's wealth. It's wealth that Halliburton, Dick Cheney, George Wade, it's wealth for these guys. And that's, if, if you want to know the dangerous addiction that's ruining America, it's not heroin, cocaine, or crime, or anything like that, it's wealth. These guys got their hundreds of millions, and they want more, and they got their billions, and they've got to have more billions. And they want it, and they want it, and they want it. And they don't, they don't realize they're going to die anyway. You can get all this wealth. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look ye on the wreckage. You're just a little pile of dust now, aren't you? Well, <laughs> all three of these, somewhat different but interrelated, are not competitive, not mutually exclusive. The presence of one interest does not preclude the other. And why would we say that moral considerations are mutually exclusive and they cancel out these economic realities and these class power realities? Sure, they parade moral professions. All nations, all leaders, all movements, all individuals believe in their own virtue, think they're operating from the highest viewpoint. And the, and the, and the ruling class mass line in this country just talks about our virtue and tells the people that we are so virtuous. We're here to help these poor downtrodden people. We're here to help these poor people in the Middle East, self-government and democracy. I mean, here are civilizations that have been around for 6,000 years and we're going to show them how to live and show them how to do these things. And they leave out the fact that Iran had a democratic movement and had a parliament back in 1950. They forget to mention... They forget to mention not only Iran, but Iraq had a democracy. Right. They were perfectly capable, they perfectly well knew how, and it would have been a very successful country. And it, was, and, and it would have had a great standard of living and a great democracy if the U.S. hadn't gone in there with using Saddam Hussein to destroy them, as I've already discussed. So, 
No ruling empire stands naked in its ruthless expropriation. They all adopt the self-justifying, non-falsifiable, ideological gloss, which some of their leaders and proponents may even believe. They may even believe, sure they believe, yeah, we're doing this, this is helping, this brings prosperity, this is good for everybody. Saddam Hussein was a torturer, but you know, it's very easy for them to do that. Benjamin Franklin talked about that. He said, man, is such a, uh, it's such an, a creature of reason. When he wants to go out and do something, he'll always find a reason to justify it. You know? um, the project for a new American century in their rebuilding America's defenses, which of course is the whole Bush administration, is from the project of Wolfowitz, uh, Rumsfeld, Cheney, they're all, they're, all, they're, all, they're all signed on to this, they're all members. But one of the things, I don't want to go into all that, cover some of that, one of the things they pointed out was they suggested that the United States might see fit to develop biological weapons that can target specific genotypes. That means gene pools of people, specific pools, in order to transform biological warfare from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. Now there's the magic of a ruling class morality. There it is. In the hands of others, biotech weapons like that would be instruments of terror. In the hands of these people, they would be instruments of virtue, a politically useful tool. How righteous is the sword of our Lord. Well, what are we to do, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters? We're to organize, we're to get our voices heard, we're to show our anger, we're to work at the grassroots, we're to work, impact on our leaders, increase our base and impact on those above. We are facing a reactionary force. You want to know where, how to do that? All those people who came up before I spoke, they're showing, they're showing what to do. People who are busily doing things do not ask, well, what can we do? I know we also ask, what can we do to be effective, to be more effective and all that? And that's a hard one, because we are facing a reactionary force that's going all the way. These guys are playing for keep. And, the, and that pussy willow democratic leadership doesn't understand that. You know? I saw John Curry quote, it was some time back, but he said, well, when all of this is over, George Bush and I will probably sit down over a six-pack and have a whole debate about the Patriots versus the Rangers. And I'm going, cloying, <laughs> disgusting. What, the, what do you think you're doing, you jackass? They're going to kick you up one side, down the other, you know. But we have to work in broad-based coalitions with everybody, including Democrats. I have friends who are Democrats, liberals. They are sounding like me lately. You could hear they are angry, they are in high dudgeon, they are really moving. And there's a lot of those people. And, you, and if you looked at the Democratic Convention, the people in the audience were way ahead of that asshole leadership that was up there on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I think of the Democratic Party, I think of Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde, when he came, made his trip to America, he landed in New York and people said, oh, you've got to go visit Niagara Falls. Oh, you've got to go up to Niagara Falls. It's one of the wonders of the world. It's one of the great wonders. So Oscar Wilde went up to Niagara Falls and he took one look at Niagara Falls and he said, Niagara Falls is the second greatest disappointment that American brides experience on their honeymoon. <laughs> And that's what the Democratic Party is to me, is the second greatest disappointment. <coughs> We're getting screwed and really not very well, either. <laughs> so, brothers and sisters, don't mourn, organize, agitate, keep fighting. The people are the substance of power. If there is a really determined movement, and that was one of the mistakes of the Democratic Convention, we're going to uh, uh, dilute it, water it down, and that will attract the undetermined voters, undecided voters. When did you ever attract undecided people by watering it down and feeding them pablum? 
You've got to get them by organizing, mobilizing, bringing the intensity and the feeling and the urgency and showing what the issues are. And not only just this issue, that issue, and that issue, but showing how these issues are all linked. The people who are bringing you disaster here are also bringing you disaster there. And they're doing it for those same class interests. So don't mourn, organize. Thank you very much. We're going to have uh, take a few questions of uh, Dr. Pranti. Uh, it's getting late and he's tired of his travel today, so uh, we can't do this for a very long time. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I just want to uh, uh, say something. Uh, we, I know that as you came in, you gave generously, uh, but I want to ask you to the extent that you can to give a little bit more to be even more generous to so that we can continue doing uh, these events. Now I just want to share this uh, very briefly, uh, briefly with you. When we uh, decided to do this, it, what we had in mind was not just one event and have everybody come here and enjoy the talk by Dr. Pranti and just go home and watch Fox News or CNN. <laughs> we, we really wanted to uh, help a movement, a people's movement in the U.S. because we are, after all, part of the community here, part of the people here. Now, this is not going to be part of the reparations that U.S. imperialism owes to the Iranian people. It's not part of the reparations that Iranian people are owed, or just like the reparations that the U.S. government owes the Native Americans, the African Americans, the Latinos, la, uh, la, Latin, uh, Latino, Latina people, and every other people. But I just wanted to ask for your generosity to make this happen. Now, that reparations we will get from the billionaires and bankers and people on the Wall Street, we'll do it together because we have the same enemy. Wherever we are, the Iraqi people, the Iranian people, the Palestinians, and the American people, working people, have the same enemy. But we have to organize, we have to be on the streets. The Democrats, the Republicans, they're not going to do it. The uh, people in Congress are not going to do it. The courts are not going to do it. We, we will do it on the streets. That's the only way it's uh, been done in the past, and that's the only way we're going to do it. If you look back in the history, every time, women's right to vote, African Americans, freedom, and everybody else. So, thank you very much. Uh, please uh, give generously, and we are going to go to question and answer now. We'll take a few questions. Thank you. First question: Where do they give? Where are they giving? Um, there's a. Uh, there's a table oh, there they are, the guys with yeah. the boxes, right? Okay, pass will pass it around. I see people just all of them. Everybody seems to be reaching for their wallets at the same time. Yeah, go ahead. You gotta give. Them, why don't you take one of those mics off? And you can no, no, no. Everybody over there, and we, they're going to line, line up. No, no. We, we're only going. It's only going to be about ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Right. I, I, uh, so we're going to make it quick. This, this one. Is, this one. Right over there. So anybody who has questions, please line up here. There's a microphone. You can ask a question. Uh, we can't do this stuff uh, for too long. But just uh, maybe two or three people. I'm just going to take two or three questions. Um, you know, I said organize. I really mean it now. So now yeah. <laughs> really. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we got to get this on microphone. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there, you can there. there you go. Uh, this is, yeah, yeah this uh, Yeah, you are a great thinker. I really uh, oh, uh, enjoyed. I am, 
more or less familiar with your books and uh, thoughts. Uh, yes. There's a but in this sentence, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, go ahead. Yes, you uh, uh, told us about the great problem that we have in the world. Yes. But, uh, and you say that we have to protest, we have to movement and all of that. But what are we going to do about that? This is the problem. I may want to just say a few words about this. Just a suggestion. With the growing technology and increasing efficiency of production, this means that we have to have even higher rates of growth of production. 3-4 percent perhaps is not enough these days for keeping our employment uh, high enough. We have to even grow higher. This will <coughs> give to the world a growing gap Talk between the... Talk into the microphone because you're losing... It's, 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 yeah, it's finished. Yeah, it's finished, yeah. yeah. Uh, just sure. Bit, yeah. It's growing gap between the rich and poor with this age of uh, communication and uh, lots of uh, internet and this and that, how are we going to uh, stand this? I mean, uh, shouldn't we try to perhaps as soon as possible take all the borders and have mutual benefit and commonwealth of nations instead of killing and cruelty among us and all of these uh, all things right. that I, I don't think... I, Thank you very much. I, that's, the, uh, that's not... Um I don't think that's really my analysis that the rich technological nations are going to just brutalize the poor nations. The, the people who are paying the price are also in the rich technological nations. The rollback, the third worldization is occurring everywhere, including North America and Europe now. You, know, you see this with Schroeder in Germany. All the social democrats in Europe, what kept them honest, which kept them, what kept them serving and giving any semblance to serving the working class was the existence of communism. They had to out by, had to say, don't, don't go communist, you see, you stay with us, you can get public services, you get health care, and so you don't need communism. The minute communism left, these guys snapped and they rolled back, to, not towards center, but even right. Tony Blair is another one, right? You see this happening in all the social democracies. So um, it's not that technology is, it will give such a pro productive advantage to the rich nations that the poor nations will be destroyed. A lot of this technology is being exported and used. Um, the, it's, ha it's happening, I mean, I don't think that's the trend, that's, that's an old one, and I, and I don't think that's really what's happening right now. It's a global, global third worldization of the entire world. The question that does come up is, well, who's going to buy all this stuff if they keep impoverishing populations and keep producing and that and the other thing? There are going to be some serious crashes. You have China and Vietnam ratcheting, diving toward the bottom. Uh, maybe outselling Mexico and other sweatshop countries after a while. Uh, it's going to go from bad to worse to bad to worse. But they, there are always some people who buy. There's always some element of the middle class that's needed. People buy on debt. And people also can maintain a, uh, a, a relative consumer level by working two, three times harder. That's what they're doing. So American families today may still have their refrigerators, their cars, and they're meeting the payments in the house. But today, the wife is working, the son hasn't left because he can't afford a place of his own. He's at home, so he's working. You have three, four people at jobs uh, maintaining the thing. And, and so that's how they do it. You just work harder. You have fewer vacations, you have fewer of this. You work harder for less. And the, the hungrier they can make you, the more desperate they can make you and divided, then the harder you will work for less. That's why people in Indonesia work for 18 cents an hour. Nobody here would, would take a job for 18 cents an hour. Is it because you have so much more self-respect than the Indonesians or the Haitians? No, it's because we're at a level of historical struggle where labor has operated. That's the population, the people have operated and, and, um, and made the kind of gains they have. That's what they're trying to undo. And a lot of our democratic leaders don't get it. They are trying to get us back to 1900, where everything is privatized, there's no public services, there'll be very little public education to speak of, there'll be no restrictions on child labor, there'll be no minimum wages. They talk about it, they say it. They say we want to get rid of minimum wage, it's not needed, it's not necessary. Uh, 
There's no social security, no disability insurance, no survivor's insurance. That's what they want. That is what they are fighting for. And they're playing for keeps, and we got to understand it. Don't give them an inch. Don't, I mean, don't trust them with a thing. There's a vicious, single-minded, hegemonic, reactionary class in there. And it's going on all over the globe. And it's not really about technology or productivity, really, anymore. We have a yeah. line of people over here. Uh, Dr. Parenti. <sighs> I'm getting too emotional, but... Here's my first question. It's very short. It sounded to me the whole time you were talking that this kind of situation was occurring from the assassination of Lincoln right on up through Kennedy and anybody else. It was in the situation where they wanted to help people. And we have had several presidents who have. And they got killed. The other question is, are you familiar with uh, Lyndon H. LaRouche? Because he is talking, wait, don't do that to me. He is talking about the same things that Dr. Parenti is talking about. Uh, getting a situation I, I, I where people are being helped or should be helped. Okay, I am familiar with Lyndon LaRouche and he's not talking about the same things. <laughs> he is absolutely not. And, and you're right, that political assassination is one of the instruments of ruling class control. It most definitely is. Uh, let's just have one, uh, let's just have two more questions, okay, and that's it. Just really quick, Dr. Parenti, can you please uh, give your opinion? What do you think might become of uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, or what? How is those events going to unfold? What do I think, what? Yeah, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, how do you, what do you think is going to become of Venezuela? I think he's, I think what he's going to become of him, I don't know. I'm going to Venezuela the end of, um, I'm going to Venezuela at the end of, um, uh, I, I forget when. Right uh, oh, end of November, I think, and beginning of December, or end of December, beginning, I don't remember. But, um, oh yeah, it's end of November. Uh, I think he's terrific, and it's a perfect example of everything I talked about tonight. You get a leader who has the temerity to take some of the oil profits and do things like open up health clinics in the poor neighborhoods open up uh, public schools, tuition-free public schools. The Venezuelans, for years, couldn't, couldn't send their kids, the poor couldn't send their kids to school because they couldn't pay tuition. Uh, there are people in Venezuela who are middle-aged who are seeing a doctor for the first time under Hugo Chavez with chronic ailments and such. Uh, and for this he's maligned. But you see, you don't talk about that, you don't say, we don't want him in because he's giving things to poor, right? raising their expectation levels. They'll want paid vacations before you know it. They want this, they want that. And the more for them is the less for us. And, 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 and they, they, then they're going to be, instead of sitting in doorways and begging and waiting uh, to work for me for pennies, they'll be out there organizing. Their kids will go to college. You know what can happen? You can get, you can get some uh, working class Italian immigrant family, send their kid to college and get a PhD from Yale and start talking like this tonight. <laughs> and they don't want that. And they don't want that with you. They don't want you informed and literate and, and raising questions about things. They don't want that. They want you out there tired and hungry with your nose to the grindstone. And Chavez is starting. He's opening up that floodgate of the people. The democracy actually taking over. The democracy. And the democracy is more than just a set of procedures and elections. Democracy is also government for the people. It's got to come back to them. It's got to have a substance to it. And that means a good... Uh, a good a living condition. They don't want that, man. The more democracy, the more demands, the less their power, the less their wealth, the more things are cut into. What are you, what do you people want? First you want your labor unions, then you want guaranteed job, then you want paid vacations, then you want a health plan, then you want occupational safety. And you want, when is it going to stop? I'm going broke. I don't have a penny left for myself. I was saying to my wife back at the mansion just the other day. <laughs> So that's what they hate. That's why they hate Hugo Chavez. Because you can really ask the question. You could say, "What? What's the animosity toward this guy? He wants to use some of the oil earnings to help the poor." They never join that question. The question, they may, they maybe even reference it. They'll say, 
uh, and he's trying to buy political favor by putting up these health clinics and food kitchens in poor neighborhoods. Food kitchens, can you imagine? In poor neighborhoods, trying to buy, trying to win popular favor because he likes power, because he's a nut, he's erotic, erratic. He may be erotic too. <laughs> Aren't we all, baby? Okay, but um, I'd like to see one story in the New York Times about Hugo Chavez where they don't call him mercurial. You know what mercurial is? That's someone who, you know, goes up and down. So, so there are these ad hominem attacks have been delivered against every single leader in history, from Robespierre to Huey Long to to Milosevic now. Milosevic, you know, a democratically elected president of Yugoslavia, was supporting the keeping Yugoslavia a multi-ethnic Yugoslavia. He's probably the only non-nationalist, and he's been labeled again and again through that process of repetition, a Serbian nationalist who's committed all these atrocities. That trial on him is falling apart. They have, they don't have any evidence showing any kind of genocide on his part, or war crimes really to speak of. Um, but you've got people who have people who swallowed that line, including people in our camp. <coughs> so, so this is what you've got to wonder about. They're always, they always subject leaders. Anytime you see your media launching ad hominem attacks against any leader of any country, you can be sure that that guy is trying to do something, some little something for the people of his country. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Parenti, I... Almost yeah. over. Uh, Dr. Parenti, I really wanted to thank you for talking about your students because in all countries it's very easy to fall into that trap of being uh, Uncle Tom. My, my question is this, um, I was hoping you could comment on the uh, recent terrorist attacks in Russia and, and the timing of them, the timing being so close to the Rep Republican National Con um, Convention. I don't think the timing was linked to the Republican National Convention because, it, first of all, it, would, it blows away the after effect of the convention. And I'm not sure they wanted that. Uh, but, of course, it is good right to remind people of these terrible terror threats. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any sympathy for the Chetnin um, terrorists or any of these nationalist groups, the KLA. I saw the KLA uh, Albanians in Kosovo killing people, and among the people they killed were other Albanians who were Federalists who said we should keep our Federation together and all that, um, and, and, and a number of Kurds who collaborate with the U.S. Uh, in the worst sorts of policies, So there, and the Tamal Tigers who were kidnapping children and, 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 and raising them as soldiers. These, these ethnic armies that define a country in terms of the purity of a particular one ethnic group are not, that's not my politics. I don't believe the ethnicity of a people should determine the polity. Because when you start doing that, you create minorities within minorities and, they, and then these people are kicked out and these are kicked out and, uh, and you're, going for, you're going for ethnic purity, forget it. The big, big, biggest ethnic cleansing. The big, big, biggest ethnic cleansers in Croatia were the Croatians, not the Serbs. The biggest ethnic cleansers in Bosnia were the Bosnian Muslims and Croatians. And the busy, biggest ethnic cleansers in Kosovo were the Albanian KLA, CIA. That's who, that's who they were. Um, and that's the same with all of them. So I, 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 it, I mean, I know the, Ru the Russians have been pretty brutal down there in Chechnya. And, um, it's a kind of a situation that, uh, that, that has no heroes to it. It's, it's a pure, low-level <sighs> nationalist kind of fighting and killing all those innocent children. What, what's, the political, what's the political gain of that? In fact, there's an enormous political loss that comes from something like that. Okay, I am going to take, that was going to be the last question, but since we have a wim woman, we will have since, since women so rarely can get to the microphones as these guys get up there. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Parenti. Thank you so much. I appreciate your sheer brilliance, how you deliver everything so clearly for us. Thank you. Um, I want you to tell us, um, I worked very hard for Dennis Kucinich during the primary. He was the only Democrat who was able to bring forward a uh, progressive platform, but the Democratic Party pretty much buried him. Um, and, uh, and just listening to Sel Miller, 
on the Republican convention uh, gives me pause. So I've, I've, been st I've been talking about the blue dogs in the Democratic Party. Why don't we just let the blue dogs take over the Democratic Party and build a movement outside of the Democratic Party so the progressives can join us? And by that I mean voting independent, uh, like Ralph Nader and Peter Kameho. How do you feel about that? Thank you. Well, the problem is our numbers are so small, yeah. and we have to sort of admit that. I worked for Dennis Kucinich, too, and he could not break double digits, you know? He had the best, best message, best analysis, nobody couldn't break double digits. Part of the reason is the media. It's, it's not, we don't have a, a democracy, really, we don't have an open system. It's a locked, closed system. Kucinich was designated a minority candidate, an inconsequential candidate from the very beginning. They were the, the forerunners were stated as John, it was K Curry and Howard Dean, but Kucinich, and often he wouldn't even, his little soundbite or splice wouldn't even be shown. People didn't even know he was in the campaign in many cases. So that, that's the problem with mass voter politics is when you don't have the mass media or access to it in any way, then, then, you, then you get shut out. Uh, Proportional representation, yes, I have been advocating that for years. I was one of maybe three political scientists in the world. And I mean, E.E. E. Schatzneider and Duverger and myself are the only three I know who were pushing proportional representation back in 1970. But now it's become a real issue, even in political science and other places. Yeah, that would, be, that would mean a, a party that got 15% of the vote would get 15% of the seats instead of zero percentage. Uh, and it would be, and those countries that do have proportional representation generally have more democratic parliaments, a more visible and viable left, and better social services and better health services, and and and, and the like. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Screening. Um, it's 1:30 at McCarth Mc what Mc something Park. <laughs> <laughs> MacArthur Park. One line they go out. Okay. And, and one other thing, please. When you're exiting, try to exit in a single file line. We had some problems before with uh, capacity, so just try to leave orderly and. Um, Can you make that announcement? It's very important. Sub Tomorrow, September 11th. Tomorrow, September 11th. Seventh in Alvarado. Seventh in Alvarado, Los Angeles. Seventh in Alvarado tomorrow, but that's not the one I was talking about. Um, I don't know right now. I don't know right now. There's a film screening at MacArthur Park at um, Burbank. Where's Bill? Anyhow, thank you all for tonight. Thank you, Michael Parenti. Thank you, Library. See Lisa in the orange shirt. Lisa in the orange shirt.